Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. Asali Solomon's first novel, Disgruntled, a portrait of Philadelphia in the late 80s and early 90s, was named a best book of the year by the San Francisco Chronicle and the Denver Post. Her story collection, Get Down, earned her a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and was a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. She teaches fiction writing and literature of the African diaspora at Haverford College. Her new book follows two women who reconnect years after their college days and rediscover themselves amidst the questions asked at middle age. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with Nicole dennis Ben, author of Patsy and Here Comes the Sun, a New York Times notable book and a winner of the Lambda Literary Prize. Thank you both so much for being here. The screen is all yours. Hi, Asali, welcome. Hi, Nicole, welcome to you. And yeah, welcome to everybody it. in Zoom land. <laughs> yeah, and we're so excited to have this conversation. Congratulations on such an awesome book. Um, this is you. now your third novel. It's um, my third book, my second third book. novel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And listen, The Days of Africa has um, been such a great um, comfort to me over the past week, um, or actually months, because I blurbed it in addition to um, yeah, right. this talk. And so I can't wait to um, share with the audience, um, you know, parts of this novel and also talk about it as well. So mm -hmm. I know you wanted to start off with a five minute read before we get into our conversation. Mm -hmm. um so let's do that first and then we'll jump in okay um all right so i'm reading from the days of Afrikiti, and so you don't need a lot of background to listen to this scene but the one of the main characters is lizelle and she um is married to a man named win and this is the the uh a, a flashback to their wedding and what's important about lizelle at the point when she got married is before she married win she was a lesbian and she sort of changed her life and marries Wynne and, and this is the wedding scene. The ceremony at a local Episcopal church had gone well. Though there had been some uncomfortable spaces between his words, the minister, as old and white as a ghost, hadn't said anything too off-putting. Lizelle's mother, Verity, who was aggressively friendly with Wynne and his family, hadn't frowned, and the unity candle hadn't set the altar afire. In the aftermath, wife sighed with relief and leaned against husband, but found that his body felt rigid and unwelcoming. She pulled away to look at him. What's up? Lazelle, said Wynne in a thick voice. Did we just do something terrible? I mean, did you really want to do this? Lizelle hugged her bare arms, suddenly cold. She felt the complicated underthings from the wedding store cutting into her torso. What are you asking me? Did you? Well, I'm the one who proposed. In fact, I proposed everything from the beginning. I'm asking what you wanted. When, she said, panicking, a shadow in the corners of her eyes, threatening to blot out her vision. I did what I wanted. What the hell? She could see the photographer approaching. Wynne's mother at his side, looking worried as always. They were gonna take photos with Wynne's rich racist grandma, who unfailingly called Lizelle Lisa and became irritable when corrected. The other grandma, racist and not rich, had stayed in Fresno. Well, we can take these expensive pictures as a souvenir, said Lizelle, feeling the spirit of Verity in her, and then we can hammer out the divorce. No, that's not what I meant, Wynne said. I'm never divorcing you. Isn't it a little early to be renewing our vows? That's funny. That's a good one, Wynne said solemnly. In a rough motion, Lizelle took Wynne's arm to make a formal entrance into the hall. She knew he was not seriously reconsidering their marriage, but the conversation gave her the beginnings of a headache. Thinking of the evening as their last date, Lizelle was at turns mechanical and reckless. A smile that did not reach her eyes for photos, gratitude and platitudes offered at all the tables they visited. A stiff burst dance to Heroes by David Bowie, which Wynne thought would be cool. Of course, it sounded insane and desperate, 
because the song was meant to sound insane and desperate, no matter how the young wedding singer tried to sweeten it. Nihilism flooding her body, Lizelle drank champagne and played with Wynn's cousin's Daisy's beautiful hair. Then the DJ finally took over, put on Marvin Gaye, and Lizelle invited Verity's date, Mr. Charles, to dance. Verity glared from the sidelines. Lizelle knew full well that Come Get to This was one of her mother's favorites. Mr. Charles was effusive. I think this might be the best wedding I've been to, beside my buddies where Robert Bell played. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Lizelle had heard him speak of that wedding many times, and despite her general distaste for him, she could not help feeling honored that her wedding was in the league with it. You know Robert Bell from Cool in the Gang? You look just like a princess, Mr. Charles was saying. I told your mother you'd find your way. I've been telling her. And don't let anybody say anything to you about the interracial fact, because if you catch a hold of something good, you can't let go. These men out here ain't shit, he said, reminding Lizelle of something Verity often said of Mr. Charles. Excuse me, Mr. Charles, Lizelle said, and headed into the mercifully empty bathroom. She tried to negotiate the full skirt of her ridiculous lace gown. She'd essentially let Verity pick it out to get herself onto a toilet in a cramped stall. She wondered how many, many, how many women brewed up wedding day yeast infections in sweat-soaked underwear as she struggled to peel off the $50 slip of cotton. She threw it in the little box meant for menstrual trash and left the stall. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was a, such a funny scene. Um, I mean, listen, and also afterwards, of course, running into Wynn's sister. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I really yeah. like that scene too, but I didn't want to go on too long. No, it's okay. Listen, this is your show. So absolutely anything you want to do, even if you want no, to- No, no, I'm ready to talk to you now. <laughs> All right. So I have a quote here. Um, you know, I was before, even before the show started, I was saying how much these characters, um, this how real they feel. And um, Anne Patchett actually had said the same thing in her blurb of the book. Um, she said, you know, the days of Africa is so elegant and fresh, so sophisticated and modern. I didn't feel like I was reading this novel. I felt like I was living it. I loved every minute. And same here. I loved every single minute of it. I laughed out loud. Um, you know, there, there, even in, in the moments that I felt like were meant, um, you know, to be serious, there was st still oh, yeah. a lot of humor um, right. around it. Oh, and Selena, I was just floored by Selena's point of view. Um, mm -hmm. So before I even jump into Selena or even jump deeper into Lizelle, I know that this book was actually inspired by Sula, um, by Toni Morrison, and mm -hmm. Zami by Audre Lorde, and also, um, also Mrs. Dalloway um, mm -hmm. by Virginia Woolf. So I, with my little, I'm a, a, a huge Audre Lorde fan, of course. So there was a quote here by Audre Lorde that made me think so much of, of these two women. And I'm gonna read it here um, before we um, jump into the questions. Mm -hmm. So Audre Lorde writes in Zami, I lost my sister Jenny to my silence and her pain and despair to both our angers and to a world's cruelty that destroys its own young in passing, not even as a rebel gesture or sacrifice or hope for another living of the spirit, but out of not noticing or caring about the destruction. I have never been able to blind myself to that cruelty, which according to one popular definition of mental health makes me mentally unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, um, that quote again, I'm like, I thought instantly of Selena um, mm -hmm. and the way how she feels about the hurt world around her. Um, mm -hmm. So deeply so that of course, the um, decision was to put her in a psychiatric ward, you know, because of mm -hmm. course if there's mental illness around that. Um, but just knowing what you're doing with this um, book and this character who I also, I really relate to. And, but also Lysel, or, who, or Lysel, although we, we, there was a conversation about the pronunciation of her name, Lysel, right? Lysel, Lysel. Lysel, Lysel uh, who straddles a duality um, that often leaves one mentally unstable as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, in terms of her class, you no, know, she's a, a completely different class and of course straddling race. Um, you know, and this is exhausting um, emotionally and mentally. And mm -hmm. I want you to talk about that, like the decision there that in, in that irony within itself, you know, of these two women who obviously, obviously there's a lot going on. And I want to know how you came about um, with them, with putting them on the page and them being so alive. Like what were you, what was your process with that? 
So, I mean, it's it, sometimes it's hard to reconstruct a lot of these things. Um, I was, before we got on the, you know, before the webinar started, I was talking to you about how somebody made a joke with me about the book and I'd forgotten something in it. And when I was like looking over it for things that I was going to read aloud, a lot of it, I mean, it's almost like a distant memory you have of, <laughs> of writing these things. You're like, oh, I guess I did this because it's here, but I, you know, it's almost like something was happening to me, but as far as creating the characters, I think that, you know, the first thing that came to me in this book was this, the first image in the book, which is like Lizelle taking a phone call from her mother who's basically scolding her. And that was like the first thing that came to me on the page and it moved out from there. But in a sense, I created their characters together because I wanted to create these two Black women. There's a, there's a passage in I mean, I think it's at the very beginning of Zombie, actually, where Lord talks about, you know, like the many women who'd sort of been through her lives and left their imprint on her and that kind of thing. And it's also true of Zami that at the end, the relationship with Kitty or Afro Kitty is also a brief one. And like it's, but but what's kind of interesting about Lord is her idea is that these brief relationships are just as important as longer relationships. And so in a sense, I created these characters together as two people who had really shifted each other's lives in a sort of brief time together. And I wanted them to be sort of complementary in a way. And so that's the idea of one who's like sort of so sensitive to the world that she almost cannot get on with her life. And the other one who could go that way, but decides not to, right? And that that's a that they're sort of complementary to each other in that way, like one who has spent more, one who is sort of unable to build up an armor because it would sacrifice like a sense of empathy in her that I guess is like necessary for her survival, and the other one who has spent a lot of time building up an armor, and in fact, by the time we arrive in the novel, has built up an entire life as an armor in a sense. Yeah, I, I got, I really, I got that. I got that. And even when, what Ami um, just said, what Afriki, um and, you know, her significance um, in Lord's story, I thought about Selena being divine, you know, that was a very brief um, encounter with, between the two women in, in undergrad, you know, Selena, mm -hmm. um, Lisa was on her way out as a senior, Selena had just entered. And so that mm -hmm. very brief affair was something that was significant in both women's lives um mm -hmm. and I just thought that was so endearing that this was um a relationship that lasted and it kind of it reminded me again of course of Sula and Nell mm -hmm. you know um that relationship that Toni Morrison had built between these two women um you did it with Lucille and also with Selena mm -hmm. um and it's the importance of these relationships romantic or not um mm -hmm. you know between these two black women um mm -hmm. so one of the things I wanted to ask you then because you know what what when you know when did it occur to you that you know this scene that came to you was in the um with between Lisa and Verity um on the phone but when did it come to you that I want to actually base this book on um Zami Sula and Mrs. Dalloway well so it's hard to say right so I would say that the first, it was kind of interesting because I think zombie kind of came last, but the, okay. the, the, and Mrs. Dalloway was more, less of an issue of me necessarily engaging in a conscious way with the themes of Mrs. Dalloway and more thinking about how much I like the structure. Mm. Of it. So I like the structure of it because, you know, you have this really bounded, you know, scene that's happening in the present. Yes. But from there, you can sort of like jump all over around in time, you know? And right. so there was something extremely elegant about that, that like, you know, sort of apropos of nothing, I just started thinking about. And then I reread the book and I was like, yeah, that is a really sturdy and interesting structure. Um, and, you know, it is true that as you go through life, you're having your day, but you're living a bunch of other days all the time. Yes. And so I was really interested in that kind of architecture, like the arch with the with the architecture of memory, let's call it. And I also, you know, I kind of had this like joke with myself about how like there were too many dinner parties in American in like mainstream American literature. But yeah, I was like, like and then I was just add another one to this, you know. Yeah, which I thought was brilliant, by the way. 
Well, yeah, no, country. I mean, yeah. it's like the dinner, like dinner parties are totally overrepresented in American literature. The way like murder is overrepresented in movies or whatever, or in TV shows. <laughs> just like, yeah, they, you yeah. Know. So I just, I like the idea of that, but I also like the idea of doing that with like these characters, you know, um, puzzling through their issues. Um, and then in terms of Sula, I really, it's hard to reconstruct a timeline of this, but I do know that, you know, I had, I mean, that's definitely one of my all time favorite books. Um, and yeah, and like for, for so many reasons. Um, and I think that I had worked with a couple of students on like theses about Sula and, you know, they had, they were sort of like thinking about, you know, a book that was about this two women who their most significant relationship was with each other but it wasn't a book about romance you know right and thinking like well what if you know what if it was what if romance was in it you know and so it was just kind of like a what if that was a, a kind of tribute and an engagement with Sula and then I think Zami kind of came naturally but I think thinking about like the reason I was thinking about that book, and it's kind of funny because a lot of this, what we're talking about right now is like literally just in the book in a conversation. Yeah. But one of the really interesting things about Zombie is when Lord talks about how like, you know, there were, she was, she was in these communities that were majority white women uh -huh. and the black women would sort of move around the edges of the circle and they, they might sleep together, but they didn't really have relationships because it was too yes. painful. And yeah, so like, I, I was just kind of interested in that too. And the fact that like, you know, in terms of being in romantic relationships um, as black people, you're like, there's a lot of difficulty that you're dealing with, right? And so you can bolster each other or it can become very difficult, right? Yes. Um, and so, you know, my my thinking about Lizelle, Lizelle particularly is that like, that was something that was really hard for her, right? Yeah. And, you know, again, Asali, just a comic of your work because, you know, there's an inside joke. There's an inside lesbian joke um, with all of us, actually. You know, the woman who is the... the this cell was described as the wolf on campus at Bryn Mawr College, which mm -hmm. ironically, I mean, my wife grew up in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And <laughs> so I, we delighted in the fact that your book, we, we're sharing your book right now. Um, you know, she has it reading. And I, um, the fact that Lisselle was, was described as the wolf, right? And the irony of her marrying a white man, um, or not even a white man, a man, right? Yeah. And it, it's like an inside lesbian joke that actually became public um, uh, with this book because Lisselle ended up as that woman, as that girl who we all mm -hmm. know in college, you know, who was doing all these, these women and then she ends up in a heterosexual relationship mm -hmm. and actually the most rigid of them all. Yeah. And so I love what you did with that. I don't know if that was intentional in terms of what you were doing with the self character, but I mean it wasn't, and I wasn't privy to the joke, but I will say oh. that, but I will say that um the it's funny because she makes a comment like, like, you know, she she's mad, like when they call her the wolf, she's like, Oh, these are exactly the white women that are gonna go off and just like, you know, go on ski vacations and then like right. you know. <laughs> and talking, right, yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, so I really appreciated that, um, seeing that and knowing, and this, this knowing you actually explained this out really well. I mean, I got her too, like in terms of the armor that she has to build for her survival. And it's so true mm -hmm. because one of Lisa's biggest fear is being Verity. Yeah. She doesn't want to be like her mother at all, you right. know? Um, and so I feel like every decision that she has made, be it sub subconscious or conscious, is a away from Verity, um, her yeah. mother, um, who I felt like was a dynamic character but um, a character that um, Lizelle really fears. And at one point, Selena even said to her, or said to herself, like, but what's wrong with Verity? You know, yeah, right. Wrong with Verity, <laughs> right? You know, but, Selena, like, but Lizelle really abhors Verity's character. She doesn't like her, um, she, she, I mean, she loves her mother, obviously, but she just doesn't want to be her mother. And that's, I understand that, um, you know, in terms of the armor that she's building. And, but opposed to that, um, Selena has another older woman in her life who she aspires to be in terms of the sexual freedom. Um, baby, aunt, sorry, aunt, Auntie Baby. Auntie you baby, know, yeah. Um, yeah. And so I want you to talk about these older women in the lives of these two Black women um, on the page, the influences of these two women, Verity and Auntie Baby. 
Well, I think it's like, I mean, this is another thing that is really engaged with Sula, which is that the idea was that they came from two houses that the other one would have wished that they could have lived in. Yes. Right. And so that was actually like a big part of the construction of their families, you know, yes. and it's not like, you know, I don't, I don't think the thing with Verity and like the thing at Selena's house is she's so lonely, you mm-hmm. know, because her mother is so sort of her I mean her parents are have, are together because they're yeah. going to be together but they're like they're living they're like, a whole war of a relationship right yeah and then there's so much propriety there's so much talking in you know uh like talking you know not talking around issues whereas Verity you know I still laugh at my own joke where Verity would be in the supermarket and be like is something wrong with your bowels or whatever yes. just like <laughs> so like you know for Lizelle it's like horrifying and she feels like there's not enough of a boundary between her and Verity, you know, yeah. and Selena would want something that like was much more straightforward. And so, you know, I mean, I just think it's really like, it's one of the things that I always do in books is like, I don't quite understand plots that don't register a sense of like where the characters came from in terms of family. Yeah. But I mean, I imagine some people live, live very distant lives from their families, but even when you do that, they still have shaped you. And yeah. so I really spend, always think about like how the, and there's even that one scene with Wynn's family, just like, okay, this is, this is the sense of who this person is. Yes. Um, you know, and so they're looking at these women and they're not consciously, you know, not consciously moving away from them or conscious, but, but definitely like learning about them yeah. and being created in whatever they're learning about them. And so, yeah, so Selena has her mother, Alethea, then there's Aunt Baby. And, you know, I also was interested in the way that like these things that seem really small in childhood like, you know, if somebody had told Alethea, like, oh, do you know that <laughs> this sequence of events maybe has its root in California when Selena <laughs> heard this thing in the night? Like, you yes. know, what are you talking about, you know? And so I think that, like, that's, um, you know, that was, like, an important part of the construction of it was that was having these different models that they basically yeah. were trying to either move away from or unconsciously imitating in one way or the other. Yeah, and you know, even though um, I say to my students all the time in terms of seed planting, you plant so many seeds um, in the early chapters. And so, and the seeds, these seeds blossom as you water them because one of the other biggest seed, big seeds that you planted was sexuality. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, Selena seeing Aunt Baby for the first time, um, having se- like, or just her foot underneath some man mm-hmm. and got the, uh, instantly, um, you know, was attracted to the idea of mm-hmm. sex, uh, but mm-hmm. not necessarily liking it, but attracted to the idea. Until mm-hmm. years later, Auntie Baby said, "Oh, I don't care for sex that much," you know. Yeah, right. Um, right. right. Yeah. I, I thought. I thought. I thought was really, that was really well done. Um, mm-hmm. And even you know, you, you do this all at the often in your work. Um, even in that New York Times review um, that I read this morning, that was so on point with your craft. You have an a, a, an ability to have your stories just beautifully unfold. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is the day in the life of a woman or the night you know, her dinner party, but so much unfolds. And by the end, by, by the time you get to the end, and I'm not, I don't want to give the, away the ending to those who are going to be buying the book tonight, mm-hmm. but by the time you get to the ending, you're like, oh my God, like each fabric is like so well stitched and ironed and starched. It's like <laughs> amazing what you do um, craft-wise. And so I, I really commend you for that. Thank um, you. Yeah. And there's also the effort that you put into each character. Like you also mentioned family being important. So we saw Wynn's family and what, you know, what he comes from and, um, you know, in, on the main line, you know, the furniture, the, the dark furniture from different eras or centuries, you know, bequeathed by all the grandparents, parents. And then, of course, um, but versus um, Lizelle's family, Verity, who, you know, from Philadelphia, I think, was mm-hmm. it West Philly or? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, West Philly, right? And Another thing that you do so well in your works, especially in this book, is straddle class lines. Like mm-hmm. the class dynamics is so palpable. Like I, I feel like I, I saw every, every like, even down to how um, the, um, you know, immigrants are treated. You know, mm-hmm. you do have Lisselle who has this woman who's working for her, mm-hmm. um, and her daughter who's obviously a PhD student, but 
you know, on her hands and knees scrubbing the floors and doing the, the dinner party stuff. Um, and so you have a good um, commentary on class mm -hmm. in America. I feel like most people, most books you read, um, is like, oh, race, you know, mm -hmm. but the class part is kind of hidden a little bit or implied. You mm -hmm. really went in with class. Mm -hmm. Um, so talk about that um, some more in terms of your fear um, coming up with, or even like having that in the back of your mind as you craft these stories, especially yeah. this novel. I mean, I'm just really interested in these forces that shape people's lives, you know, and I think that what I, one of the things I was really interested in, in this book, and I've always been interested in this, because one of the things when I first started writing that I really wanted to do was explore intra-racial relationships, like mm -hmm. relationships between different, between Black people, you yeah. know, Black people of different colors, Black people of different classes, Black people who spoke differently from each other, you know, this kind of thing. There's so much fabric and drama in there, yes. a lot of it being shaped by racism, but just like interesting in and of itself. But one of the things that I, I, I still think there could be more of is thinking about like, if you're, even if you're writing about race and racism, first of all, you could write an entire book about race and racism, just about black people. Like you don't even need to, you know? And so that's kind of, I was, you know, I've done a lot of that, but also like, if you're writing about race and racism, it's also just not like about black people and white people. That's not where we are. Right. So the, I thought it was really interesting in particular that, you know, she has like the um, this Mexican American woman who works for her, the daughter who works for her, and also thinking about Lizette. So the the daughter um, Zochio is a PhD student whose mother is a housemaid, and so you know she's on an upward class trajectory, and it's an awkward situation for Lizelle, who's somebody who didn't grow up in a house where anybody like you know I mean maybe the plumber would come, but there was certainly right. wasn't anybody who was going to do do work around the house but also she is they should they they should be somewhat simpatico because they're both like on this upward trajectory and yes some way, right and yet there's this like weird tension between them but one of the things I wanted to write about was that I mean there have you know there have been you know, since since the beginning of the country, you know, there been, there were free black people, you know, there were upper classes, whatever. Um, in some ways, you know, that's that's expanded, obviously, but like there are different issues that arise, right? When yeah. people are able to attain a certain level of status. And while certainly, you know, um, there are things that are just as threatening to black people with money that are threatening to black people without money. You have a certain set, a different set of dilemmas and responsibilities if you're a black person. With money. You can't just be like, well, you know, I'm yeah. black. So that means I'm ultimately sympathetic in whatever situation I'm in. Like, you know, like, yeah. so I just, but I also like the idea of presenting that as like a, just a tension that didn't really couldn't really be resolved like Lizelle really couldn't resolve you know yeah and of course in typical Asali Solomon um fashion it was a joke I mean yeah was, right no I mean <laughs> couple, like even though the description you know um her being this um uh, woman fanning across the gulf like um like the description of her being this the mistress um yeah. in the big house you know looking yeah. at the worker in the fields right. you know I just love the descriptions um around that um, as well. And all the characters have some kind of mystery um, to them because there's also this, um, I get the sense of this um, house, this um, helper, um, she kind of, kind of looking down. I mean, this style is so vulnerable. Yeah. You know I mean, she might not exu um, exude that, um, you know, but she, I feel like in her, it, it, just the way how she feels, her insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do feel, you know, the, the, the person like, just looking like, oh gosh, you know, kind of shaking her head, like, poor you. Yeah, you know, right. so I felt that. I really felt that. Um, and yeah, another yeah. thing um, that also that I wanted to even touch on, because I feel like when I'm looking at the characters in scene together, um, you know, um, there are there are times when I said, well, yes, because I, I, I love when these two women were on, in, in scene together in their flashbacks of college life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from you know, meeting the first day, you know, in this in this English class, in this literature class where you know, black women writers were being taught, you know, and, you know, the, the fact that there is this, Lissell dropped the class, you know, and Selena stayed. 
And there was this, I don't know what you do in, in terms of that relationship being built from there and then going moving forward as a, a, a romance that of course fell, fell short, but there was something mm -hmm. beautiful in that intimacy. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you were thinking about the what ifs, what if Sula and Nell really did hook up? You know, what would that look like um, for you? When did it occur to you that Selena was going to be the one to um, just, or just not be okay? Like, you know, in terms of her falling out, like, did she drop out? She dropped out of school. Yeah. And yeah, like, what, what, um, how, like, walk me through Selena's characterization. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you gave her her own POV. Um, mm -hmm. But walk me through her, th th that decision or not to, to have her go in yeah. that direction. You know, it's funny because it, it wasn't a decision like that. It was like, that, that's the way the character came. The way the character mm -hmm. came to me was somebody who was like, uh, extremely fragile and um, because they, she was just really susceptible to, you know, being, feeling too empathetic or feeling too absorbed by like basically evil in the world and historical evil in the world. And, you know, the reason I was thinking about that was just because I think that like often when, you know, and I think especially in our uh, sort of contemporary life where we're really inundated with news of what's going on down the street that's horrible but also what's going on you know around the world that's horrible and then also what's going to happen to us in the future that's horrible is a lot right yeah, so definitely. you know but it's considered sanity to be able to absorb all that and keep going mm -hmm. right and so I was just interested in the idea of somebody who like was actually responding to these things the way it would actually more make sense to respond, <laughs> respond to them, yeah. you know, like, what if you actually took it to heart every time you saw somebody on the street who looked like, you know what I mean, that they were about to die, you know, or what if you took these things to heart, but like, it's right. actually considered, you know, I just, I just thought that was a kind of interesting idea. And that came to me at the same time as the idea of the character came to me, actually. Mm. I love it. And to what extent is research a part of that? Because even those are the meds that she's taking and what the therapist is telling her and all these things, it's so real. Um, yeah. you, know, you really feel for Selena in this book. Um, yeah. And that's what I want to even get across to the um, listeners. You feel for Selena in this book. I really, you know, I'm like, wow, this poor woman, um, you know, from her leaving, dropping out of Bryn Mawr, um, going to some other school or dropping out of that school as well. So mm -hmm. ending up doing menial work you know um and living with her mother who's braiding her hair like a child i remember that description um you know but also the heart um, of selena um you know it's so I, I felt that because even when she was describing her relationship with herself there were again sexuality she said you know even though she didn't care there, there are times when she faked an orgasm for example but she wanted to get up oh, hurry up because she wanted the cuddling and mm -hmm. i found that so endearing she really loved Lisselle. You know, and so I could tell um, that was her rock. Even in the midst of her mental chaos, they, mm -hmm. that was her rock. Um, mm -hmm. And so that came through really beautifully um, mm -hmm. in, this, in, this, in the whole story. Yeah, so thank you for that as well. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and, and what you just said made sense. It's really realistic how oh, we should be going, um, we should be reacting. You know, every time you check Twitter, you know, there's mm -hmm. always something. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm gonna now shift, um, kind of a little bit from the the, the storylines in itself to um to re uh, well I was just research but in terms of the what you want readers to get from this book what do you want readers to take away from this book um the days of Africa so I mean I don't it's like I don't know that there's anything particularly like I like to say that I'm hoping that people who read my books it helps make them more human and then I think the other thing is like, if people are laughing, like I'm extremely happy about that. That's like a really big thing. And I think also like, you know, like I recently and certainly in the last couple of years, I definitely just spent a lot of time thinking about like the enterprise of writing and like, what is the point? <laughs> you know, cause you're looking at all these other things happen and you're like, oh, you know, like, should I be doing something a little more 
useful. But what you reported to me was that like, it was a really, really transporting experience, you know? And so I'm hoping to give people like, rather than a certain kind of message, like a really transporting experience, and then hopefully some questions that they can sort of think about. I mean, one thing that I definitely like was just like straight up kind of didactic about was like, there's that scene where they start talking about North Philadelphia and, you know, Zell basically is like, oh my God, these conversations, it's like people are talking over just, you know, mountains of just horror and covering up with words like family and schools and safety and kids, you know, and like, that's something, you know, I want people to think about, like, when they have these polite conversations about, you know, that are essentially covering over, like, racism or, you know, mm-hmm. just other kinds of disenfranchisement, like, but that's yeah. something that I just think is kind of interesting to think about, but, you know, I think that, like, I mean, I hope people read the books that, that I'm sort of, like, in conversation with, um, and, you know, hope that people sort of find in it questions that they, that, that they find interesting. Yeah. I, I, I saw, I love that you, you don't hold back. You don't hold back at all. In <laughs> fact, you, I mean, yes, through the humor, I, I there are so, there's, there were so many truths that were said that were written and you didn't hold back. You didn't shy away. You, you didn't even cross out, you know, in the editing process, like, oh no, some, so-and-so is going to be offended. Let me take that out. You didn't do anything. It was just all there, like boom. You know, Should I have I, held I something that. back? You think? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it so much because it, it makes us sit uncomfortably in these truths. You know, um, I think the best writing is when you are able to be uncomfortable yourself as a writer, like writing through that. But also, mm-hmm. I learned the readers to sit uncomfortably in these truths, and so I, I appreciate that. You know, um. It's obviously, it's obvious that you're not pandering, you know, to an audience. You're like, oh, look, here it is. You mm-hmm. take it or leave it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's why I appreciate this book so much because yes, I was laughing out loud, but I was also nodding my head like, yeah, that's so true. That is so <laughs> true. Yeah. So again, um, I mean, you did so well with this um, in terms of the truth. And another thing that I wanted to ask you as well, um, in terms of, you know, having a book come out is one thing, you know, there's anxieties. I mean, you, you um, this Gruntle came out to, um, you know, um, I think it was 2015 or 2016. 2015, uh, yeah. 2015, right. This Gruntle came out and then bam, here's um, the days of Africa in the middle of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what is it like to drop a book in the middle of a pandemic? Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny because so the, I think like at some point it was meant to actually have come, come out like, a year ago or whatever and late when it did when that wasn't happening I was really relieved because I was like oh my gosh like I can't Ah. even you know so honestly like this seems I mean I don't even know like can we still call this a pandemic or do we just call this a life yeah at this point (laughs) like I think at this point we're calling it life and so And it's really like, at this point, life is about like, you know, good, hopefully good things. We'll have some good things that will happen occasionally. Yes. And so, you know, it's actually for me, like a fine time. I mean, of course, I wish I could be in person with you, you know, yeah, um, and doing that kind of thing. But in terms of like, it actually is like, I think that you know, I'm glad actually to have a book that people can, you know, read right now when things are still so stressful. And I think that um, the other thing that was like heavily, on, it, I mean, I wrote this, I actually wrote basically the draft of this book, the first complete draft of this book in like 2018 or something. Wow. And at that time, I was like feeling stunned and traumatized by the election or it was 2017, right. 2017. So okay. that was uh-huh. the sort of trauma, but I specifically engineered the book to be set before Trump's election mm-hmm. in a time where no one knew all of the things that were about to happen. Exactly. Yeah. Verity was even having problems pronouncing Barack Obama's name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> like, so in a sense, they're so innocent, right? Yeah. At the same time, like at the same time, though, there's this note in the book. And this was something I conceived even in 2017 of everybody feeling like, you know what? Something 
is really about to go off the rails. Like this is all about to end. We don't yeah. know what this, you know, whatever we're calling this is about to go off the rails, you know? And so there's that moment where Selena's in the rain and she's like, yeah, you know, this whole world is going to fall apart and then yeah. I'll be on the same page with everybody. Right. And so, yeah. That. And so it's kind of funny, like when things really started to get dramatic, you know, I was like, oh, cause you know, the book, the book, I was still like, you know, sort of like revising and all the kind of stuff, but all that, those essential things were already in it. Right. Just yes. like a sort of premonition about future disaster. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Ooh, so, wow. So next time I'll be like, okay, I saw this. Can I read a drop of your book? This is like, a sense of what's going to come in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, all, all I had to do was read New York Times articles about climate change. It wasn't, oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like yeah. Master Diamonds, yeah. but all know. of that. Yeah. Man. And I mean, and then finally, too, um, so you have a PhD in literature, mm-hmm. uh, obviously. Then who are your literary, literary influences? I, I mean, aside from Virginia Woolf, um, Toni Morrison, and Audre Lorde, mm-hmm. you know, because I read somewhere that you, you would also teach your students um, literature by women of color, um, which mm-hmm. I commend. Um, so who are your literary um, influences? I mean, there I have tons of literary influences. I, everywhere I go and everything I do, I always talk about Maud Martha, um, which is Gwendolyn Brooks, um, yes. the poet, wrote one novel. It's Maud Martha. It's my all-time favorite novel. Um, and then, you know, I, certainly, so I've been um, teaching in a course, a recent course, Black Memoir, um, June Jordan's memoir called yeah. Soldier, A Poet's Childhood, which is like, an incredible book that I don't know if you know how a lot of a lot of people read and just like the sort of ingenuity of that book and the craft of that book is something that is really important to me um Lucille Clifton the poet is one of them and I can't properly call her an influence but I feel like at this point I've spent so much time reading her work that was probably just like in my body yeah <laughs> like definitely and like also when I'm tired and I'm like oh I have this teaching job I have these two children blah 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 I like think about her like six children just like I know and, you know <laughs> I know I mean I don't think they make them like that anymore, no, anymore. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> you know I think about I think about her and, and there's other like there's um there's a book by Mary Gateskill called Two Girls Fat and Thin that I think is actually slightly in this book. What? I need to read that. Oh yeah. No, you yeah. should definitely read that book. Um, and Linda Berry, um, you know, her novel. So the novel Cruddy, I wouldn't say was an influence on this, but she has a book called What It Is that's about writing that I think about a lot. Okay. Um, and you know, I mean, there's there are many, many others, but um, those yes. are some of the ones that come to mind. Oh, well, no, you're one of my favorites because I love this book. I love the disgruntled, and I felt like, yeah, you are, um, you know, one of those authors. Who, like I said, you just come in um, and just deliver the work unflinchingly. Like you just give us these characters that are so memorable that they are part of our families now. You know, yeah. their aunts, their mothers, their neighbors. You know, so you did that so well and continue to do that really well. But that is also really true of you being unflinching. Oh. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Thank you. I try. I try. Yeah. I really try. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because yeah, one of the things that I, um, you know, I always think about who am I writing for? Right. And, you know, I write for me first. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, right. And I know you know this, you know, writing the books that we would have, what we would have wanted to read, mm-hmm. you know, growing up. You know, mm-hmm. um, and so that's that that's first and foremost mm-hmm. um for me for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Asali. So now it's 8 14. I'm getting a nudge. Um, so I'm gonna now open it up for audience QA. Um mm-hmm. so yeah. let me just read a few here, which mm-hmm. wow, it's coming in. So Steve Steven, um, he says, um, hi Asali. I love the Lorna Simpson collage on the cover of the day, the days of Afrikaans. And I wonder if you're writing in conversation with her work, as well as Wolves and Morrison and Lords. Huh. Yeah. So first of all, hi, Stephen. Oh, you know, okay. <laughs> I, knew, I know Stephen. Huh. Um, um, so you know, that is a, that's a really good question. I wish I had a better answer to it. I mean, the, this, this collage came up you know, is one of the options for the cover. And it is incredible. And I think that 
what Lorna Simpson does. And I guess, I mean, basically this question is an elegant way of, of sort of thinking about um, the multiplicity of Black women's identity, because yes. that's so much of her work is about the multiplicity of Black women's identity and the, and like what these different things look like. And I think, and like, just really like exploding any notions of flatness or sameness, you know, and that's really something I do a lot. And yeah. not really as similar to Lorna Simpson, not as like a public service announcement, but because it's about beauty and, you know, being interested, you know, it's just like black women are a rainbow of fascinatingness, you know? Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's some of what she does in her work. And I guess, I guess that's something that I've try to do my work as well and so the the cover is just like one of my absolute favorite things about <laughs> about the book yeah, you know? beautiful beautiful by the way yeah mm -hmm. oh thank you for that Stephen. um and then karen <laughs> karen jordan is asking um hope to read your book that i ordered today and enjoyed as much um thank you for wishing um so thank you and wishing you much success okay so that's, that's a um, statement and then Mary Mayer says, thank you for all of this. I really am interested in the idea of these books that you're in conversation with while writing your book. What questions did you continue to turn over after reading Sula, Mrs. Dalloway and or Zami? So, I mean, I think like one of the, one of the questions that I think in Sula is like, the, and this is a weird thing to say, but Sula is almost like a um like biblical text or like sacred text or something. Yeah. But not not in the way that like I love it so much, it's so great, but in the way that like you read things and you're like, wow, I have no idea what that is, but it feels like something heavy. You know, like there are all these little things in the book, like, you know, and and this is something that really happened to me like you know when I was studying literature I read that book a hundred times but there's still things that I'm just like I don't quite understand this thing but it feels so important and real you know the Deweys or you know yes. when the, like, the little drowns or you know just so many they're almost like symbols and parables and you know and so it's it's, it's, it's like so there's, there's these sort of little questions there, but there's also a question about how to construct a work like that. And that's something that, you know, I'm, I'll figure out maybe when I'm 86 and whatever. <laughs> but like, how do you construct something that feels so weighty and is kind of, you know, like has deep emotional resonance, you know, but also these things that you almost feel like you're just accessing them in the way that you access dreams, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and, you know, one of the interesting things about Zombie, uh, when I read it as a, as a grad student was that, like, the question of memoir often is, like, how somebody chooses to begin and end a memoir, and particularly something like that, because there's such, a, and it is, you know, Lord calls it a biomythography, because yeah. there's, it's not, even though it's linear, it's not a linear representation of her life, you know, because right. it's like you read that and then you go and you're like, oh yes, and then she married a white librarian and blah, blah, blah. And then later, blah, blah, and you're like, what? That is a zombie. <laughs> but like thinking about, you know, what are the most, you know, what is the, the, what are the materials from your life that you want to sort of make stories out of, you know? Um, and so, you know, for a long time, I thought about what, you know, what she was trying to communicate from the specific stories that she chose in that book, you know? Yeah. Because there were so many other ones that she could have chosen. Um, exactly. So, I mean, those are some of the questions that, that still remain with me about those books. And for Mrs. Dalloway, I think it's another question of like, I'm still not even sure why that structure is so compelling, you know? But there's something very compelling about that structure. Yeah, and you know, even as you talk about Toni Morrison, um, you know, teaching her books um, in my classes, you know, I, I noticed that Toni Morrison, she breaks the quote unquote rules, you know, um, she knows mm -hmm. the tools, she, has, she knows the rules, but she breaks some, them so many times, and I, I just think that's so gangster, the way how she can just um, write something and it's like, whoa, you know, um, for example, in craft, right, we right. learn separate points of view, like, oh, give, give so-and-so their own chapters, and you know, right. that's how you organize. But 
in, in Toni Morrison's work, somebody else's point of view could have slipped right in and in a paragraph and like, did that just happen? You know, and it's nothing but a thing. Well, the other thing about Sula, which is like one of my all-time favorite things, is that Sula dies and she's still thinking about right it. about death, right? She's like, but she's no, she's dead. It's like yes. she dies and she's like, oh, that didn't even hurt. Wait till I tell right. Mel. Wait, like, oh, wait a minute. Mel. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just love the permission. She gives herself so much license, and I I love yeah. that. And that's why she gives me license. And oh, yeah. like, I feel like I when I read her books, I'm like, all right, yeah, I can I can totally do this. You know, yeah. without even worrying about um, rules, like forget those. Let's tell a story. No, um, totally. I love no, it. it's just yeah. No, I mean yeah. she just makes it. She just and you know her thing is like she doesn't make it easy. You have to come over exactly. there. Yeah. You know. So yes, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. I think each year, you, each time you read her work, you get something different mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's another person here. Um, actually, um. Liz, um, Liz Moore, um, can you talk about your earliest experience with writing? Did you receive positive reinforcement from teachers or other adults, or was writing something that you did um, did privately in any capacity? Okay, first of all, hi, Liz Moore, the writer Liz oh. Moore. Um, so, I mean, okay, like, I think I've said before somewhere that, like, you know, when a, like a famous actor's kids go into acting and they're like, I came up with this on my own. Like my parents are not writers, but I feel like they were writing stage parents. Like my, I was like indoctrinated. <laughs> like I was indoctrinated with literature, right? So my mom was really, they were both big readers and my mom was a huge reader of like fiction by black women. Mm. And she was always talking about the characters in these books like they were real people. And so early on, like, I just got a sense of that as something that was like happening, you know, like I still, you know, I, you know, she'd say, yes, that, that person has that graveyard love. And I was like, you know, it's from Song of Solomon. And I thought like that was a real thing or whatever. And I just remember a day she spent telling me the entire plot of their eyes are watching God. And it was like, I, you know, I still remember and so, you know, I wrote little stories or whatever when I was little, and my sister and I are both writers, and I think it's something that um, it wasn't, you know, it was just something we started doing, and then, yeah, we did get, we got feedback, but we also got feedback that it was, like, part of a, part of a tradition that was important in our house, you know, and, like, my father writes songs, so there was a lot of creativity there, and you know, I definitely got encouragement from teachers at different points. I remember this one time, though, when I was in high school, I wrote a story that was like, it was kind of a horror story. And there were some gaps in it that were meant to like foster the horror. And the teacher took it really literally and like gave me a C and it was like a huge outrage and all this kind of oh, stuff. No. So, you know, there were haters, but mainly, you know, I definitely got a lot of positive feedback from family, from teachers, from people I, I showed things to. Um, so I think that, um, and it was just something that I did to amuse myself as well. Yeah, love it. Wow, all right. So, um, so Sally, you do have a lot of questions coming in actually as you're, you're um, talking to Betsy um, Tanninger. Um, I hope I'm not, not missing um, up her last name. I heard someone talking to a writer online the other day and wondering how they could write in this time of ap ap apocalypse. <laughs> and the writer said, writers are always, write, are always writing in a time of annihilation. Thoughts? Thanks. Can't wait to read the book. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true. You know, I mean, I think that like the, I think that different writers definitely have different moments in the in the time of annihilation and like there were times during this where I felt more annihilated than other times you know and so and certainly it's not always po I mean it's not possible to create if you don't have the basics you know um but at the same time like it's you know you think about people who like were writing 
slave narratives to like get the slaves free you know it's like and you know they were nominally free at the time but that didn't mean they weren't living with annihilation and apocalypse you know or the the generations of of you know indigenous writers trying to like sort of like testify from like the the sort of like continuing destruction you know and so I think that that's like I think that you know, if we can do all the other things that we can do, like if you're able to do the other things that you do, you know, I mean, people keep working, people do that. That's what part of what writing is. And also, you know, writing is a, is a something humans do to try to make sense of what's happening. Yes. And so it's not, you know, like certainly, but I think it's also true that for me and probably for a lot of other writers, the writing doesn't come from a place of like being, you know, satisfied and totally you know like (laughs) complacent with your life like that's not that's not gonna you know like from the earliest writing in one's journal about the indignities of like you know middle school slights or whatever it is about trying to figure something out so it kind of makes sense that um people just keep continue writing through like different moments like that yeah definitely and then even us I mean People have been doing it since, I mean, I remember I used to be so inundated by the questions um, during the Trump era, actually, mm-hmm. you know, what is it like to be a writer in the time of Trump, you know, and I'm like, people have been writing. Um, there have been writers, of- yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So I always thought, you know, I mean, not that it's a stupid question, uh, but still yeah. I'm like, well, you just write, you know, yeah. um, dig deep into yourself. There's so much things um, that we can write about and also escape within ourselves, within our imaginations. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Ken um has um says um Kalfos says hi Asali, congratulations on the novel. I wonder if you see a connection between the themes of your new book and Get Down and Disgruntled, your previous books. I mean, so definitely, like, there's the, you know those books are also about racial identity and class and sexuality and Philadelphia. They're all set in Philadelphia. They're all about different parts of Philadelphia. Um, and I think that the, the books all also like have these moments where people are examining themselves within like majority white settings and trying to calibrate their identity and thinking about that. Um, I think that the, the big departure here is that this book is like, oh, is about adults. Now, with a caveat, it spends a lot of time in their youth because I'm never kind of leaving that behind. But I think that this is like, the difference is like, I think it's funny because I basically jumped from like middle school to like 40s. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, the other stuff is in it too, but it was like when I was finally ready to leave behind like seventh grade, I was like, okay, now it's going to write about 40 year olds or whatever. Um, but I think like there's definitely like, I'm always looking for the sort of like small, sharp observation about how life works right? Like how these interactions between people work, you know, and what are the things that are, what are things that I've like seen that I've never read about, right? That's something I'm always trying to, trying to think about. Um, and that's, so it's not so much of a theme as something that I, that I hope comes up in all of these books, like things that you've like certain kinds of phenomena that, you know, you've seen, but you haven't seen reported in in literature Mm. that's very deep yeah very good and um robin riskin actually um uh, there sally you were actually my supervisor at Harvard college and it's amazing to see and hear you here loving this conversation i also wanted to ask if or how your teaching feeds into your writing process and vice versa so Certainly when you're writing, you remember you, it helps you think about how difficult it is to move from a space where you're looking at a blank page to move to a filled page and that there's kind of a miracle in that. And so continuing to write really helps me get in touch with that um, and remember like the, you know, how hard that is. Um, And I think like the, as far as like how the um, teaching is shaped. I mean, I think that like, I really, 
I feel like I learn new things every day from teaching and from watching what students do that then I can take into, into the writing, right? Like things that students do to make things seem real or things that students do to make things humorous. Like I remember those while I'm in the writing process. Yeah. Yeah. I always think, you know, I learn from my students as well. You know, we teach them, but also they teach us. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful and, and well said um, <laughs> as well. Um, so, um, so far, um, Karen oh, Jordan. But it's 8.30. Aren't we supposed to ring off I, now? I know. I mean, Karen Jordan has said this. She said, ever, ever discouraged from writing? Oh, have you ever been discouraged from writing? If so, what do they think of your success now? The now haters. No, I wasn't. I mean, I get all the rejection that, that writers get and all the discouragement that writers get in the course of things. But no, I, nobody actually has ever really, you know, um, done you know and done that in a way yeah. that like, would make a colorful story so beautiful asadi well you're an inspiration and thank you so much this is amazing thank you congratulations yes oh. congratulations again and please if you're listening go pick up the days of africa you won't be disappointed it's an amazing amazing novel and then and when you're done Asadi's with book, that by the way oh you, you can read what? this book <laughs> what a plug i love it <laughs> thank you unflinching oh. all right <laughs> thank you Thank Good you. Yes. Good night. Good night, everyone. Night to Sally. Bye.